have a seat let me share with you some announcements so you know what's going on in the life of the church and while I do that if you would give us the registration of your attendance you'll find uh, registration pads on and offering baskets on the end of each row pass those down get your offering give us the registration of your attendance and if you're on the end of the row take off that uh, registration pad piece of paper and put it in the offering basket that'll make it easier on the folks that uh, collect those at the uh, end of the service we've got a lot of things going on uh, I want to tell you about, and uh, I'm not going to read all of the announcements, so I do encourage you to pick a, uh, a, a, a announcement sheet up there out on the welcome table so you can know what's coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, tonight at 530, we've got our youth uh, meeting, 7th to 12th graders. Uh, they meet here in the Family Life Center. And then uh, also this evening at 6 o'clock, we're having our Southern Gospel singing over in the uh, sanctuary. And there's going to be folks singing, uh, different groups and individuals are going to be uh, uh, singing. And it's going to be a time of worship. We'll have some congregational singing as well. Uh, Carrie's going to play a piece and, and whatnot. So it'll be a great evening of worship and, and, uh, and time together. And I understand there's going to be cookies. Is that right, Ruth? We've got cookies involved. Okay, so that always, you know, that draws them in by the thousands. So uh, uh, that's good. That's good. And I understand you're cooking them. So ooh, baking them, I should say. Not cooking, right? Baking. Baking. All right. So uh, that's, uh, that's going on tonight. Some children's ministry dates. Uh, today we've got at 4 o'clock uh, Club 118. This is our 4th, 5th, and 6th graders are going to meet at the Wood Home. Uh, if you need more information about that, Deirdre's uh, number is in the announcement sheet. You can pick that up out there on the welcome table. 
Uh, Methodist men are meeting this week on Tuesday at 6 p.m. at Milano's Pizza, and all the men of the church are invited to come and be a part of that. Uh, our missions ministry meeting is happening this Thursday in uh, Harper Hall at 6 o'clock. If you're interested in helping us to make plans for different mission, local and otherwise, uh, opportunities for our church. I know they're focusing on Highway 80 Rescue Mission. Uh, they have a, a cookout kind of thing going on soon for that. Other ways that they can serve. If you're interested in, in being a part of that, anybody uh, who wants to be participating in that is welcome to come to that meeting and get involved and get plugged in in that way. Uh, our mission barrel for September, we are collecting items for the food pantry at the Mission House. And uh, it's things like cream chicken and mushroom soup, refried beans, pork beans, Ranch style beans, seasoning packets, there's other things in here. Uh, be sure to pick that up on your uh, way out on the uh, announcement sheet. And then we've got a group of folks that are going to be traveling next Sunday down to uh, uh, Baldwin, Louisiana for the Sager Brown mission trip. And uh, very excited that uh, these folks, we've been trying to get something like this together for a few years now, and it's finally happening. And uh, you may see some blue shirts that are standing right here. If you're, wearing, if you're on the Sega Realm uh, crew, why don't you all stand just for a minute? Uh, you can see them all around. This is what I'd like you to do. We're going to pray for them real quick. Uh, and uh, if you're near them, I invite you to move over next to them. Lay your hands on their shoulders. That means some of you all need to get up get going here. Let's get around these folks. Let's surround them with our love. Let's surround them with our prayers. Uh, and if you're back and still in your seat, just kind of extend the hand out, okay? As if you're laying hands on these wonderful folks. What they're going to do is they're going down to Sager Brown. Sager Brown is, a, is a, uh, a hub, if you will, that puts together all kinds of, of mission uh, buckets and things like that. There's, there's uh, hygiene buckets, there's flood buckets, there's, there's uh, first aid buckets. There's all kinds of things, and they're going to help to organize these things. And so whenever there's a crisis around the world, uh, they send these, these resources uh, to the front lines of need. And, uh, and so our mission team are going there to help get these things together. They're going to do some other projects, I believe, with them as well. And, uh, uh, and so we're very excited about you guys, and we want to cover you all with prayer and, uh, and give God thanks and ask for safety and protection. So let's bow our heads as we do that. Heavenly Father, we lift up our Sager Brown mission trip. Father, we pray that you would surround them with your protection and love, Lord, that you would get them down there safely and that they'd have a great week. Uh, that they'd be a great witness for Jesus Christ to all whom they come in contact with, Lord, that the, the labor of their hands and of their hearts would be a, a labor that bears fruit within your kingdom, Lord, uh, that they would, uh, they would have a, a joy as they work uh, and as they point people to Jesus, Lord. Watch over them, guard them, protect them, and keep them safe. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. You may be seated. Uh, let's see. I want to I want to update you real quick. If, you, if you're not aware, the uh, the Global Methodist Church is currently having their convening conference for our denominations. This is the first time when representatives from all around the world, representing various annual conferences, ha are getting together. They're in they're in uh, uh, Costa Rica, San Jose, Costa Rica, and uh, we've got folks traveling in from. Uh, Eastern Europe, we've got folks traveling in from the Philippines, we've got folks coming in from Africa and the United States as well. I've been watching some of this stuff online. I am just blown away and so excited about the move of the Spirit in the Global Methodist Church. There is great fire and great energy and, and great uh, uh, passion to see what they're doing. There's a great sense of unity uh, amongst uh, things. If, if you were with us in the old United Methodist Church, there was never a sense of unity in, when it came to, to general conference. There was always infighting and, and, and fussing. But there's a sense of joint ministry together. How do we move forward to continue to be a witness for Jesus Christ in this world? And uh, so I encourage you. Pick, uh, they, uh, they're in legislative committees for a few days. Then next week, they'll do more of the general meeting and stuff like that. But they're evenings. They have worship. Those might be some great times to pick it up and, and whatnot. But it's been really, really encouraging I'm so excited. We're, we're a part of a denomination that wants to share Jesus Christ with the world, and they're, they're working to do that. So that's wonderful as well. Okay, uh, I think that's all the announcements that I have today. Is there anything else I missed? Like I said, there's others on there for the next couple of weeks coming up that you want to be aware of. Be sure to pick up an announcement sheet. Let's stand and greet one another in the name of the Lord.
sing that verse again. And when before the throne, and when before the throne, I stand. Jesus died my soul. Jesus paid, and all to him I Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. Jesus washed it white. Thank you so much for this morning. We love you, Lord. We give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. You're the only one who deserves it. God, more than anything, we desire your presence. So as we continue, please stay in this place. Speak to us, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to remain standing with me as we read our scripture before I do I just want to acknowledge the fact that uh, uh, I am grateful that Jesus Christ has washed us white as snow are you grateful for that I, I'm uh, I'm not perfect I, I, I mess up uh, I, I uh, make mistakes I sin uh, and the good Lord still loves me uh, and he loves you too and I'm grateful for the grace of God in, in my life, and, and I know you are as well. And it's uh, the greatest news in the world that uh, the one who created us, the one who loved us, the one who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, did so, so that our lives could be made clean and new and renewed uh, through the spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 6, or Matthew chapter 5, pardon me, 43 through uh, 48. Starting with verse 43, you have heard the law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect. That word there is, means complete, whole, mature. Uh, you are to be complete, whole, and mature, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. You know, in our modern world, uh, we, use a, we use a lot of words for, uh, for love. And uh, we use words like, I love chicken fried steak, you know? Or we say things like, uh, I love bluebell homemade ice cream. Do I get an amen? Amen. All right. Or, or you say, I love my cat. Anybody love their cat or their dog or something like that? Yep, there we go. Got some hands up there. Okay. You know, uh, but we also say, I love my wife or I love my husband. Or we say, I love my, I love my children. And hopefully, however, uh, you don't love your spouse in the same way that you love chicken fried steak. Okay? And that you don't love your children in the same way that you love chocolate. Those are different kinds of of loves. Let's make sure we get that clarified this morning. Well, today we're continuing in our, our, uh, our sermon series, our message series on loving well. And we're talking, we've talked about uh, loving God. We've talked about loving our neighbor. That's the first and second great commandment. Last week we talked about that uh, commandment that's kind of hidden in there uh, because the second great commandment is dependent upon it. Now it's about loving yourself. And today we're going to talk about loving your enemies. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Gracious Lord, uh, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen? Amen. The New Testament 
was originally written in the Greek language. And so in the Greek language, uh, it, it's a language that's rich with words. Lots of different words to describe things. Whereas in the English language, we sometimes you know, use one word and it means a lot of different things. And, and so it can be confusing on what exactly is the meaning of the word when we, we see it in writing. Uh, it, it may not necessarily capture the nuance. We have to look at the context and figure things out like that. But the Greek language gives you a lot of options uh, when it comes to words because it wants you to, to make sure you understand the, the nuance and the essence of what it's saying. Uh, in the Greek, there are four different main words for love. Four different main words. Where we just say love, I love chicken fried steak, I love my spouse, I love chocolate. There are, you know, I love my brother, uh, 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 those kind of things. There are, instead of one word like in English, there's four words, in, uh, at least four to begin with, the main ones, uh, in the Greek language. And I want us to look at some of these words for, for just a minute. First is storie. Storie is a noun. Uh, it is the love of a natural affection or a natural obligation. It's the love one feels for their family. Uh, it's the love of a husband to wife, a wife to husband, a parent to child. It's a quiet abiding feeling within one that rests on something close to them that they feel very good about. It's that familia, family kind of love. That safe place in your family, that, 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 bro, that, that, that uh, kind of connecting kind of tissue kind of a love. A biblical example of storge in the New Testament comes from Romans chapter 12, verse 10, where Paul writes to the church of Rome, he says, Be devoted to one another in storge, in love. Honor one another above yourself. He's, he's talking to them, you know, you should be like family. You should be members of the same family. Be devoted to each other as if... Your brother and sisters in Christ are your actual brothers and sisters. Another word for love in the Greek language is philio. Philio is the, the love of companionship. The love between close, trusting kinds of friends. It's the kind that speaks of affection, of, of fondness, or a liking of one another, wanting to spend time with each other. Philio is a love that responds to kindness and appreciation. Uh, and it involves giving as well as receiving filio is about our happiness rather than my happiness filio is about we rather than me and as such it is known as a brotherly love it's where we get the the name of the the city philadelphia the city of brotherly love filio delphia brotherly love a biblical example of filio in the new testament comes from titus chapter 3 verse 15 it concludes uh, it, where, it con where uh, we read these words uh, from Titus, uh, where it says, Everyone with me, or this is Paul, I say, Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. So in the writing there to Titus, uh, it's, it's talking about uh, a, a love that is a filio, a, a brotherly kind of love. Here, in essence, Paul is saying, don't forget to say hello to all the brothers and sisters that we care about in the faith. Another form of love that the Greek language uses is the, the form of love known as eros. Eros is a love of passion, a passion that seizes and absorbs itself in, in one's mind. It's also a love that is emotional. Uh, it's an emotional involvement based on body chemistry. It's where we derive the word erotic. The basic idea of this love is self-satisfaction. Though Eros' love is, is directed at another, it actually has oneself in mind. It's, it's the same thing as saying, I love you because you make me happy. That's the Eros kind of a love. The foundation of this love, this type of love, is, is, the, is, is, the, is that some characteristic in the other person pleases me. That's the, that's the basis of that, that kind of a love. It, if the characteristic would cease to exist in that other person, uh, the reason for you loving that person would be gone. And the result was that, uh, you know, you say, well, I don't love you anymore because that characteristic's not there anymore. Now, there are no biblical examples in the New Testament, uh, uh, excuse me, of, of eros, uh, so I'm not going not gonna to try to give you one. All right? Now, let's go on to the main one I want to talk about today, and that is one you've probably heard of before, agape. 
How many of you all heard agape before? Raise your hand. Okay, most people have heard of agape before. Agape has to do with a love that is expressed as benevolence or goodwill toward another person. It's a love for the sake of the other person. It's love for the sake of the other person. It's the noblest of loves in all of the Greek language and Greek literature. It is the love that keeps on loving even when the recipient is unresponsive. It keeps on loving even when the recipient is unkind. It keeps loving even when the recipient is, is unlovable or acting unlovable or, or unworthy. It is what we call unconditional love. Agape means unconditional love. I'm going to love you no matter what, no matter what the condition is, no matter what state of mind you're in. I'm going to love you. It means that no matter what a person does to us, no matter how they treat us, no matter how long uh, they insult us, injure us, or grieve us, we won't allow bitterness, we won't allow uh, 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 hardness of our heart to develop against them, we won't allow uh, a bitterness or rage to, to invest and in, in, in invade our hearts. Instead, we regard the other person with benevolence and goodwill Wanting the best for them, even when they're acting like a complete knothead. Okay? That's a technical term, knothead, okay? Covers a broad spectrum, okay? The biblical examples of agape are many. I am not going to list them all here because uh, this word for love is used uh, over a hundred times in, in the New Testament. But I will give you one example, and that comes from our uh, scripture passage this morning. And that is Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, which says, But I say, agape your enemies. I say, love your enemies. Even when they're acting like knotheads, even when they're unkind, even when they're disrespectful, you are to love your enemies. When we understand Jesus' command to love our enemies through the lens of agape love, we learn several things. First thing we learn is that Jesus does not ask us to, do, to ask us to love our enemies the same way we love our nearest and dearest friend or family member. He's not asking you to, to, to make them, uh, you know, graft them into, the, into your bloodline or family or anything like that. This is not filio. This is not storge kind of love. He does not command us to treat our enemies as our best friend or even our family member. But ha he is, however, calling us still to love them. Okay, He's still calling us to love them. Second, what we need to understand is this. Agape love isn't just a matter of the heart. Rather, it's a matter of the will. Remember, we talked about benevolence towards, uh, uh, will towards them in a way that you want the best for them, you will the way the best for them. Agape love is a love of the will. It must be chosen. It has to be a decision that you make. I choose to love this person even uh, when they are my enemy. It's a determination of the mind. It is a decision uh, of the will that we have to make. We must choose to love an enemy. Third, third lesson we learn is that showing agape love to our enemies doesn't mean that we become a doormat for them to walk through or walk over, okay? Uh, there are those out there that think, well, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to love this person, so that means I can let them do whatever they want to do to me. I, I can let them uh, berate me. I can let them walk all over me. I can let them abuse me. That's not, what, uh, not the kind of love that, that Christ is espousing here when he says to love our enemy. Showing agape love doesn't mean that we allow the person to do whatever they please. It doesn't mean we allow our enemies to walk all over us, take advantage of us, insult us, humiliate us. Uh, we can still show our enemy love while at the same time setting up appropriate and healthy boundaries with them. Learning to say, no, I don't have to listen to this. I'm not going to put up with this. I'm walking away from this, whatever it may be. We are responsible for ourselves and what we allow to happen to us in relationship with other persons. We are responsible for how that happens. We can say, no, we can walk away, whatever, hang up the phone, whatever it may be. Here's fourth. The fourth lesson is this. It is impossible for a person to live out the commandment to love your enemy apart from Jesus Christ. Let me, let me emphasize that here, okay? It is impossible for us to truly love our enemies in the way that, 
that Christ is calling us to love our enemies with agape love, an unconditional love, even if they're unkind and hurtful and mean-spirited and all those. It is impossible for us, folks. We can only do this through the, through the indwelling of, of the Holy Spirit in, in our lives. Only through the supernatural work of Christ in our lives and God's grace flowing through us are we able to love our enemies. It is only as Christ works in our heart that bitterness can die, healing can happen, and agape love can eventually spring forth. Okay? You get the picture here? All right, that's number four. I've got one more. Number five, okay? Jesus' command to love our enemies not only calls us to a decision of the will, but it also calls us to action. Agape is a, a verb. Agape is an is a, is a, is a, uh, action oriented kind of a love jesus teaching in the scripture this morning uh, it spells it out for us uh, loving our enemies is something that we do jesus doesn't say uh, to think nice thoughts about our enemies he says do good to those who hate you he doesn't just say uh you know uh, say a nice comment about them or whatever he said bless those who curse you he says Pray for those who mistreat you and to give to those who take from you. Folks, these are all actions. Jesus calls us to act in a way that is loving and kind, even when the other person is not being loving and kind. It is what sums up the golden rule. You all know the golden rule? Say it with me. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Now, five lessons, very important lessons, good to get that kind of stuff clarified so that we don't we don't become somebody that gets trampled in the in the midst of life but rather we learn to love in a way that's healthy uh, for the other person but also healthy for ourselves one that's not just lip service or or, or, or that sort of thing but actually is one that is that is acted upon and, and and lived out in in our in our lives so but there's one final question that we need to ask one final question that we need to to ponder as we consider this whole thing and that question is this who is your enemy okay who is your enemy now uh, sometimes when we when we consider who is an enemy we think of someone who has an arch nemesis okay someone who is a great evil in the world that this person's against or whatever it may be we think of harry potter and Voldemort. you know you know you think of uh, sherlock holmes and and moriarty you know the great battle of the mind we think of uh, superman and Lex Luthor, <laughs> you know, there's, there's all these great arch nemesis kind of uh, people in the world. You know, we think of our arch nemesis, we think of someone who's out to get us. We think of someone who is always against us, someone who acts as our antagonist in life. But what about those people who we simply just don't get along with? Who at times uh, uh, act in ways that are adversarial like an enemy would do what about those with whom we may not agree with or maybe uh we have a problem with because we're we're in different camps politically or, or otherwise you know and we kind of butt heads against and we can even get into arguments or fight with what about those for whom we have a personality conflict you know we just really rub up against each other the wrong way and, and we just don't necessarily like to to be around them even though we may not label them as an enemy or an arch nemesis all the time every day at times they may feel like our enemy these people can even be people that are close to us these folks can be members of our family you know that we don't always get along with you know we see them at at thanksgiving we see them at christmas and and uh uh, we have difficulty with them when we do see them. It can be even people in our own church. <gasps> yes, it happens. How does this verse, how does this teaching, how does this lesson of loving our enemies from Jesus, how does this translate to those type of situations? Well, let me tell you a story. Uh, I can't say this guy's name correctly. Uh, it, it's Pachomius, Pachomius, uh, and he was uh, an Egyptian soldier who was won to Christ by the kindness of Christians in Thebes. And after his release from the military around 315 A.D., 
he was baptized into the Christian faith. Serious about his new faith, determined to grow, uh, Patromius became a disciple of Palamon, an ascetic, an ascetic pardon me, who taught him about self-denial and solitary life of a religious person. Now, what you need to know, around the 300s, a lot of Christians, uh, especially men, but there were women who did this as well, uh, were really in a, in a mindset that they needed to escape the world. And so th this is when you began to see the hermits living in caves in Egypt and the monastic development and, and all these kinds of things. And so uh, this fellow, Pontumus, uh, decided that that's the way he needed to go. That's where he needed to go. So he went and followed Palamos around, and uh, he learned about self-denial. He learned about prayer. He learned about all kinds of things from a religious hermit. And in the early years of Christianity, the model of devotion was that, to be a, to be a hermit for Christ, to, to escape the world in that way, uh, to, to resist uh, the corruption of society and to get away. These hermits wandered the desert alone. They lived in caves. They fasted. They prayed. They had visions. Many went to extremes, eating hardly anything, uh, refusing to bathe, all kinds of things. It was, a, it was a part of what early Christianity was experiencing in waves. They, they, uh, they, this, they filled the desert uh, with, uh, with these early Christians. Uh, and so such was the popular image of holiness at that time during the 300s and 400s. Uh, silence, solitude, and severity. And, uh, and this was part of Pontius' early spiritual training. But he began to question this. He began to question this whole idea of escaping the world in such a way where you go off by yourself and there's nobody around and, and, uh, and whatnot. And so he, he began to ask his mentors and, and folks that were, were uh, you know, more wise than he uh, all kinds of things about this methodology. And, and uh, you know, how can you learn humility by living alone? How can you learn kindness and gentleness and goodness in, in isolation? How can you learn patience with others unless someone puts yours to the test? And how can you learn to love if no one else is around? In short, he concluded, developing spiritual fruit requires us to be around other people. Ordinary people and ornery people. Developing spiritual fruit requires us to be rub up against, to be in family together, to be in community together with other persons. To save souls, this is what he said, to save souls, you must bring them together. Isn't that a neat little thing? To save souls, you must bring them together. He knew that in order to develop his faith, he had to do so in a community of believers with others. And so he concluded that his faith isn't only learned, uh, the faith isn't only learned amongst friends. Now get this. Faith isn't something that's just learned among friends that we have chosen. Rather, faith is something that is best learned when we can't be selective about our associates. Perhaps this is why the church, which was established by God, is not joined by invitation only. We have no choice about who will or will not be in the family of God and who confesses Jesus Christ as Lord. All who, who confess Jesus Christ as Lord must be welcome. We learn agape love most effectively in our involuntary, involuntary associations, away from the temptation of choosing to love only those who are attractive to us who are like us, and who are easy to get along with. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but not everybody is exactly like you in the church, okay? Not everybody has your exact personality. Not everybody has your exact political bent. Not everybody has your exact uh, 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 love of, of particular ice cream. I don't care, whatever it is. We are all unique individuals that God has brought together in the church and, and, and if you think that, that the church has to be made up of people who all agree with you, who all uh, have the same personality as you, who all are just as extroverted or introverted as you are, just as intuitive or, or just as uh, organized or just as, as, as uh, spontaneous as you are, whatever it may be, whatever your makeup may be, if you think that's the way church is meant to be, guess what? You got it wrong. Church is, a, is in some ways a crucible. Church is in some ways a place that, that helps to shape us and mold us. There's that scripture that talks about as, as uh, iron sharpens iron, so one brother sharpens another, you know? 
Do you know how iron sharpens iron? It involves friction. You know? We don't always get along. Guess what? That is the perfect opportunity to practice our faith. To practice forgiveness. To practice confession. To say, you know what? I blew it and I need you to forgive me. Would you, would you forgive me? How, how, you know, you want to learn patience? Be around somebody that's going to stretch your patience, you know? We learn agape love in the community of believers. Believers who may not think or act as we do. Believers who may be different from personalities than us. So forth and so on. People have different opinions who rub up against us. So Pachamos began a new way of pursuing holiness because of this. He began, instead of having all these hermits living off in caves, he brought many of them together and said, we're going to do life together. We're going to, to, to learn to, to love as God has called us to love, even when we may not like each other very well. Instead of each person seeking God on his own and hiding in some cave, he came up with a common life together based in worship work and discipline in a community of flawed demanding sometimes disagreeable people Pachamos and his followers learned to take hurt rather than give it they discovered that disagreements and opposition provide the opportunity to put their faith into practice and experience it uh, and experience God's grace through giving and receiving forgiveness thus he began genuine Christian community Pachimos, while largely forgotten in the church history, points us to that, uh, points out to us that as attractive as solitary sanctification may seem, it is life amid broken and imperfect people just like ourselves which develops many of the qualities that God requires in us. How many people in the church have missed that point? Because as soon as something rose up and their feelings got hurt and they went down the road to the next church. You know, that's the worst thing. I, I, uh, Gail McRae was uh, uh, this fella in, in my, my first church, our first church. Wonderful uh, fella. He's gone, to, to, gone home to be with the Lord. But he told me one time, he said, David, one time I got mad at something the preacher said and I left the church for 15 years only person I hurt was me. We're in a crucible. We're in a, we're, this, is for, this is so we can learn to practice our faith here, to learn to, 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 to be uh, the people that God has called us to be. God has called us to love our enemies, those who are our arch enemies, as well as those uh, who we may or may not get along with in the Christian community of believers. God has called us to, an, to have an unconquerable benevolence. Listen to that, unconquerable benevolence and an inconceivable goodwill towards others and folks the world around us is watching this they're seeing how churches people and churches treat one another how we deal with our problems how we deal with our issues is our witness to the world and we need to show them what it looks like to be people who give grace to one another we need to show them what it looks like to forgive one another we need to be their example and their model for what it means to have agape love for others to love not just for our sakes but for the sake of other people it is the noblest kind of love it is the love that keeps on loving even when the other person is unresponsive unkind unlovable acting and unworthy it is as i said unconditional love and it is important to god that we learn this kind of love so much so that he created this thing called the church to bring us together to teach us about it but this love is not learned in solitary confinement we want to learn to love others with agape love we have to do it together in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit amen amen uh, at this time, I want to invite you, invite the band to come on back up and uh, have our closing song. Uh, I, I never know where people are when, when I preach these sermons. I don't preach uh, sermons to individual persons. Come on up. Uh, uh, sometimes people say, that, oh, preacher, you were, you were preaching that one just to me. You know, that's, just, that's between you and the Lord, okay? Uh, but I, I, I do uh, seek to preach sermons that, that make a difference, that, that matter, uh, and that help 
through God's Spirit to transform hearts and lives. And so if, if, uh, if God has been speaking to you today, maybe about someone or some situation, I really want to encourage you to, uh, to take that to the Lord this week and, and say, God, how, how can I show uh, this other person that God may love? How can I grow as a Christian as a result of, of being the person that you've called me to be? And so this morning, if, uh, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ and you're ready to do that, Maybe to lay down some bitterness, some hate that you've been holding against someone else and, and embrace Jesus Christ as the one who forgives you so that empowers you to forgive others. I invite you to come forward. Let us celebrate that with you. Let us pray with you to receive Christ this morning. Uh, it says there's a party in heaven. Uh, angels in heaven celebrate and rejoice when, when one sinner repents. If, uh, if you've already done that and you're interested in becoming a, a member of Bullard Methodist Church, uh, we'd love to talk to you about that. Uh, that's something I want to sit down with you about talking about the, the mission and ministry uh, of the church. We've had a couple of families uh, do that recently. The Nimmons have joined recently, and then uh, in our other service, uh, we've had a, a family join as well. Uh, we're very glad to receive folks. And if you need this altar for any reason, maybe there's something you need to leave at the foot of the cross this morning so you can walk away uh, freed from uh, whatever that is that has been eating at you. You're welcome to come forward. I pray with you. If you want me to, just indicate. I'll be glad to do so. Let us stand together as we sing. Abba Father. Abba Father, my defender, you are holy, and I surrender, for in my weakness, you protect. cry out of last few weeks we've been learning to love well loving God loving our neighbor even loving ourselves today as we've talked about loving our enemies as I said earlier it's not something that that comes natural to us or easy to us it's something that we need help with and so I encourage you this week if there's somebody that's been on your heart as, uh, as I've been sharing this morning somebody that that you're rubbing up against or, or had a long-term pain with, I want to encourage you to go to the Lord with that person in your heart and ask God, God, how, how, can, how can I get to that place? Help me get to that place where I can, I can entrust them to you. I can lay down this bitterness. I can lay down this hurt. I can lay down this pain that I can I can even love well people who may be my enemies I encourage you to do that this week you don't need to carry that around anymore you don't need to let them live rent free in your head be freed in Christ to receive this benediction go forth from the power and strength that God gives you to be the children of God people who love well because you are well loved. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen? Go in peace.